Okay, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to tonight's lecture um, on the role of IT. This is a continuation of the communication and human needs um, lecture I gave. Okay, um, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Daniel Bowles, and I have an MBA in Information Systems. And uh, I've started several online and uh, brick and mortar companies. Um, my current company uh, that I that I run myself now is Academic Editing USA. Um, and another company that I started, um, Nova Editing, uh, was in Taiwan. Uh, most of my business experience is um in the academic editing and translation business in asia um starting companies uh working in management creating websites etc that's largely what i've done in this particular industry so as many of you who are familiar with me in my previous lectures um, and those of you who aren't many of my examples come from the academic editing um, and translation industry okay so that's just a little bit about me uh let me go ahead and uh hi robert Hi everyone. Sorry for the rush start at the beginning. For some reason, the presentation took a long time to upload into the system. So, okay. Um, so anyway, just a, a quick reminder of what we covered last time. Uh, we talked about what um, is communication technology. What are the impacts of communication technology? What are its impacts on people, organizations, and on society? Um, we talked about the skills of a communicator and how to utilize communi communication technology for those skills. Um, how to have empathy, communication, and, and human needs when you're communicating with uh customers with other people you're working with with your subordinate staff etc um we had a case study that i gave about my personal um experience with communication and making communication errors in a managerial position uh we talked about how knowledge knowledge sharing empowers others um and we also talked about growing as a communicator um, this lecture is going to be a little different than my previous lectures where I talk about a mixture of communication and human needs. Um, this lecture is going to focus more on IT and we're going to talk about um, some topics such as what is IT. Uh, we're going to talk about IT information technology from <clears throat> from different areas um, and we're going to talk about how IT affects business how it's used in business um, we're going to talk about various applications for business and the history of some of those applications in particular Excel um, and we're going to talk about the abuses of IT in business um, and then we're going to have the usual pulling it all together and then a discussion conclusion section at the end. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Okay, all of the biggest technological inventions created by man, the airplane, the automobile, the computer, says little about his intelligence but speaks volumes about his laziness mark kennedy so i want to talk a little bit about this concept of 
what is referred to by Mark Kennedy is laziness. Um, and, and a little bit of how this sense of laziness or a particular kind of laziness um, can lead to innovation. Um, and we're going to see many examples um, as we go through this lecture of how laziness um, has impacted information technology um, and how we can communicate better with information technology and how this sense of laziness has brought about some uh, some really big um, technological changes in the last 20 years of how we communicate, how businesses communicate, um, and certain IT drivers of business. Okay, so let's go ahead and dive right in. What is IT? Okay, IT is many things. Um, it's a collection of technologies. Um, information technology deals with the process, storing, and communication of information. Um, it includes everything from computers and communication systems to reprographic methodologies. Um, I'm not sure of the ages of many of you, but uh, I'm not sure if you remember um, before the, uh, you know, the pre-internet era and kind of that shoulder era from the early to mid 90s um, when the internet use wasn't as prevalent as it became and as it is now. Um, and one of the ways that you had to transmit information was using a repo graphics department um, in your university. So say for example, you were writing a report um, for a class. Um, Oftentimes, you didn't necessarily have access to a laser printer or a, an inkjet printer at home. Um, so you had to go to a place like Kinko's or to the repo graphics department in a university and print out a document and have it bound for you and, and a certain number of copies. Well, all of that, um, that print technology that, you know, the, in the, the history of print technology has remained uh, with us forever. And so we still depend on a lot of these repo graphic methodologies. Um, and we also see them too um, in our current technology. So for example, um, one of the things that I run into in developing websites for, you know, when I'm acting as a consultant for companies or for my own business is that I find um, that oftentimes certain graphic designers, um, they haven't made the leap yet from paper to data-driven design. Um, they still tend to design websites, to design brochures, to design uh, email marketing newsletters as paper newsletters, um, as something that's going to be printed and then distributed by hand. Um, what I found is, is that for the design part of your advertisements to work, um, they need to transcend the medium that they're in. So for example, if you're designing a website and you're designing it to look like a print brochure, then A, it's not going to make a good print brochure, and B, it's not going to make a good website. So you kind of develop some kind of hybrid design between the two things. Um, and so um, this isn't necessarily the fault of the designer, right? But it lets you know the background of when the designer was trained. Um, and they still have some of that print background design pushing through on their work. And so that's an example of how an old style information technology um, is still influencing and becoming part of new of, of newer information technologies and newer information designs. Okay. 
And so in furthering what is IT, um, it's the study, design, development, implementation, support, or management of computer-based information systems. And this is largely the definition that we use um, today. And this is the definition that we use um, probably through the remainder of this lecture. Um, and it, it includes and encompasses software applications, computer hardware, um, and something that I would mention would be platforms. Um, software platforms are very important, um, and they're different than applications, and they're different than hardware, because oftentimes platforms can deal with a whole host of um, a whole host of needs that businesses that businesses could have okay so that's just a simple snapshot definition of what IT is going to be for the you know the discourse in this lecture um, there's a lot of different definitions and the definition of IT as well as we go through the lecture is going to change and expand for us okay Okay, so we're going to talk about four basic periods um, in IT um, from a human history standpoint. Um, the longest period being the pre-mechanical period. And the pre-mechanical period is going to be essentially from the beginning of written records um, until about the end of the Middle Ages, the middle of the 15th century. Um, and then in the middle of the 15th century, we get into some rudimentary mechanical calculating devices and, and you know, the Gutenberg printer and, and these kinds of things that allow for mechanical information technology to spread. And then right around mid 19th century in the 1840s, uh, we get into the beginnings of the uh, of the electromechanical phase of IT. Um, the electromechanical phase is going to be um, technology that's utilizing electricity that harnesses electricity for mechanical communication. Um, some examples might be telephones, telegraphs, uh, Morse code, um, those kinds of things. And then we're going to get into the electronic era, which starts, um, I'm going to say conservatively starts sometime around the beginning of World War II, right around the mid-1930s and forward. Um, and that's the period of time that we're in right now is basically the electronic or the digital age, the information age. Okay, and um, the next phase, if you ask me what phase five is going to be, and I'm not sure if or when it, it, it started, is going to be, um, in my opinion, is going to have to do with robotics and robots um, essentially doing a lot of not just the basic tasks that human beings do, but also higher level tasks such as uh, reasoning, cooking food, performing operations, being nursing, acting as teachers, et cetera. Um, and so that's gonna be the, the next age, the next IT of a different era is gonna be the age of robotics, in my opinion. And in some ways, we've already started that age of robotics. Okay. Now quickly, this is gonna, this video is a quick and dirty overview of um, the history of IT. So I'm gonna drop the link here into the chat window. Okay. And then I'm gonna play the video um, through the YouTube player. I'm gonna let it run for about 10 seconds. If you're having a hard time seeing or hearing the video, uh, let me know and I'll pause the video for a few few more seconds so that you can um, 
load up the YouTube screen on your own in your web browser. Okay? Let me know if you have any problems. Please change in the way you do. Okay. Um, I'm looking at the chat log now. It doesn't look like anybody's having a problem hearing or seeing the video. I'm going to let it play through. Uh, let me know if you have any problems. Connected, change comes even faster. Have you ever wondered how this connected world of ours first got connected? That very first link? Who first thought to do it and why? Connections that now link over two billion of us? That's a quarter of all humanity. Connections over which we send each other some 10 billion gigabytes of information every month. Connections that will quadruple in two years. I was curious about where it all began, so I went hunting for that beginning. And Bright Boys is that story. The making of that very first connection. Preceded by the making of the world's first real-time electronic digital computer and the world's first digital network. And all of it ushering up from the minds of one small group of people. Their work was quite simply the beginning that changed everything. Hello and welcome to Bright Boys. My name is Tom Green, writer and producer at brightboys.org. For the past five years, brightboys.org has been chronicling the coming of my book, which is all about the making of information technology from 1938 to 1958. My website adventure has now produced the book that tells that story. The book recounts the incredible high-stakes journey of a team of cocky yet brilliant young men who began making information technology some 10 years before the term information technology was even coined. Everything has a beginning. None was more profound and quite unexpected than information technology. Here for the first time is the untold story of how our new age came to be and the bright boys who made it happen. It all began to come together here in 1948, 211 Massachusetts Avenue, an old run-down farmer laundry building, a stone's throw from the front door of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Bright Boys is the story of a band of brothers on the digital frontier, the rise of the first digerati, young 20-somethings who first began connecting our world, brash upstarts who went from being outcasts to heroes strangers in a strange land who spoke a new and different language, who built strange, otherworldly looking machines, and who pioneered levels of complexity totally alien to others around them. Their technology would stretch from real-time computing all the way to the shores of the internet. This guy, Tom Corbett, space cadet, who as he put it was from the world beyond tomorrow, was the sci-fi idol of the times, and probably the only one who could truly understand and appreciate what the Bright Boys were doing. The Bright Boys were young, brilliant, confident, and cocky, and thought that they could do anything they put their hands to, and usually did, which for many hovering nearby, waiting impatiently for them to go bust, was grandly irksome. There were remarks that the Bright Boys were arrogantly hi-hat and snobbish, that they were unrealistic about what they were doing, and that they were young and immature. As things turned out, and rather quickly at that, they proved themselves eminently capable. By 1950, these bright boys had built the world's first real-time electronic digital computer. Three years later, they won up themselves when they switched on the world's first digital network. In 1953, their work was met with incredulity and completely overlooked. By 1968, their work was gospel. Today, it's the way of the world, information technology. At the request of the U.S. government, they were asked to use their computer technology to create a system for the air defense of North America, which they did. What began on the bare floor of the old laundry building eventually grew to rival in size the Manhattan Project. They built the first electronic air operations center, which was copied by every modern military force worldwide, and in the process created the first electronic air traffic control center, which a half century later is an international standard for all commercial aircraft. Best of all, they save the rest of us from this. The clacking din and drudgery of geared information machines. Mechanical typewriters, adding machines, calculators, comptometers, printing presses, and all their geared kind. 
the Bright Boys labor-saving invention began a liberation process for all of us. The Bright Boys were inventive in all that they touched. They originated modular construction of computers. They invented the modem and taught AT&T how to use it. They conceived of IBM's first computer assembly line. They originated computer memory that became the industry standard until the 1970s. They introduced the first graphical interface, the first computer keyboard, and the first light gun, an early form of the modern computer mouse. Their hundreds of innovations became legends in the industry. The Bright Boy's story is history, yet it is also timeless. It is a familiar journey that repeats itself over and over again whenever someone somewhere turns a dream into a reality. I dedicated the book to all those bright boys, past, present, and future, who dared a dream to take a chance to explore and thereby to discover. As James Bryan Conant put it, Behold the turtle. He makes progress only when he sticks his neck out. Bright Boys is the story of technology when technology was young, 1938 to 1958. Two decades that ushered in the new world of electronics. A remarkable 20 years when computers were giants, their makers young and unknown, and when there is less than a megabyte of random access memory on the entire planet. Microprocessors were science fiction, transistors were handmade and mistrusted, and banks of hot glowing electron tubes ruled the land. Networks were meant only for telephones and electric power grids, and the word digital was new on the ear. As Victor Hugo wrote over a hundred years ago, an invasion of armies can be resisted, but not an idea whose time has come. Information technology was an idea whose time had come, and the Bright Boys made it so. They pushed their technology onto the world stage, a stage unprepared for its arrival an analog world that had grown content, complacent, and dependent on analog and electromechanical calculating machines. We had the engineer's dream, recalled one of the bright boys decades later, a nationally important problem that was interesting and difficult, but not impossible to solve. We were in a day-to-day -day contest with Mother Nature. The odds were bad, but we always had a chance to win, and we won all the battles. We also won the cause for digital computing, if there's anyone who thinks we didn't win, just go to Radio Shack and try to buy an analog computer. From the bare floor of that vacant factory, the Bright Boys launched the country on one of the greatest and most successful projects in the history of American engineering. No similar enterprise had ever, or has since, sprung from such humble surroundings. If you happen to find yourself one day on the sidewalk and passing your local bookstore, or online at your favorite bookseller's website, cast a glance at a book cover that looks like this, with the title Bright Boys. It's a wonderful story for readers to linger over, enjoy, and to savor. Bright Boys is an inspirational story, with real people as real heroes, of courage, of bucking the odds, of right doing, integrity, and faith in the future. For readers looking for real people, struggling to do all the things right, against all odds and succeed, Bright Boys will be a journey of delight. Scholarly research that reads like a novel, course companion, bedside pal, or ready reference to the history of information technology. Bright Boys, the beginning that changed everything. Okay, so in that video, um, you heard them talk about the early history of information technology um, as compared to the history of computer science. Um, so the reason why I wanted to show this particular video at this point was, is I want to draw the distinction between um, the history of information technology and the history of computers, because um, so often, they get overlap, they get combined together. Um, and computer science is very different than information technology in a lot of ways. Um, because information technology is and has a lot more practical application than computer science does.
Um, and so for the course, you know, for the this lecture, um, when I'm talking about information technology, I want to make it clear that we're talking about information technology and we're not really talking about the history of computers or the history of computer science. Okay. Um, and also, on a side note, if you do get a chance, I, I do highly recommend the book, Bright Boys. Um, I've read the book myself a couple of times, um, and it really is a fascinating and eye-opening book on the history of information technology. Um, at a period of time um, when the technology itself was being created, I mean, it, it's really a fascinating book. And I believe the author of the book is also making a series of either a, ser a documentary series that's going to run on PBS in the U.S., or he's making a documentary movie um, that's going to be available sometime in 2015 um, on the Bright Boys. And so if you do get a chance, I highly recommend reading the book. Um, however, it's not necessary for the purposes of this course to have read the book or to read the book. Okay, so let's go ahead and move on to the next slide. Okay, so the first phase of information technology that I'm going to talk about is the pre-mechanical phase, the pre-mechanical age. Um, and basically, in this phase, the pre-mechanical one, um, is where you have lots of technology such as um, abacus, um, hand-printed books, um, you know, clay tablets and hieroglyphs and just all the really, really early information that was gathered um, to convey um, for some sense of history, for some sense of posterity information. Like, for example, if you look at a lot of the early history of, you know, in the pre-mechanical age, um, and the written records that we do have, um, particularly in the in this in the early period of the pre-mechanical age, um, it's largely accounting um, that's being recorded. Like this number of bushels is owed in taxes by this person. This number of cows is owed by this person. Um, and so, even at the very beginning of when human beings began to write and began to record information, um, the thing that was recorded the earliest was business, was about business. And so in, in some ways, information technology um, and how human beings communicate um, in general um, in business is, is something that's inherent in our DNA and the use of this technology. And so I'm not going to go into great detail and talk about all kinds of historical examples from the pre-mechanical age. Um, the important thing to know is that the pre-mechanical age begins with the written word at about four, three to 4,000 BC um, and basically goes through the Middle Ages um, into around the middle of the 15th century. However, there are exceptions to this um, from the archaeological record, but this is just generally speaking for the purposes of this uh, of this lecture. Um, the pre-mechanical age runs from about 3000 BC to about 1450 AD. Okay. Then the next age is the mechanical age. Okay. Um, what you're seeing here in this picture of the mechanical age, this is a picture of the Pascaline one, which is a mechanical counting device um, created by a French philosopher, um, Bla French philosopher, mathematician Blaise Pascal. Um, and he's generally credited with creating the first mechanical counting device. Um, there is mention in the historical record of earlier mechanical counting devices, but there's no diagrams, there's no pictures, there's no models left. However, there is a current version, um, a concurrent version with the Pascaline one 
um, that was created by another philosopher mathematician in Germany named Leibniz. Um, and the Leibniz one, I, I believe you can still see in museums in, I think there's one in Berlin and then there's another one in Vienna that you can see as well. And essentially the mechanical age is basically when we get into using gears and boxes and pulleys and these kinds of things, um, you know, the, the certain, you know, wind up clocks and, and this kind of technology um, began to be used in concert um, with handwritten record keeping. Um, this is the era when the Gutenberg Bible and mass printing began. Um, and so Jerry, th this era still is of, of decent interest, but there's still no um, communication systems per se. Um, all the communication systems in existence at this time um, are one human carries a message to another human, either by paper or by voice, something like that. Okay, and so now we jump another another 400 years to the electromechanical age. Now the electromechanical age begins roughly around the 1840s and is and and reaches its peak with people like uh, Nikola Tesla, um, Thomas Edison, Alexander Graham Bell, the creator of the telephone, and this is when radio begins um and then basically what this is is this is technology that transmits information by the collection or use of electricity to do mechanical things okay so for example um the early telephone system with its switching networks um is a, a, a prime example of the electromechanical age. Okay. Um, another hallmark of the electromechanical age is the tabulating machine or the um, punch card technology. Um, and the punch card technology had various uses as well, especially during the early Industrial Revolution um, when it was used. I mean, it was used from everything for, you know, um, using it to as looms to weave mass production carpets and rugs and this kind of thing um, to tabulating the populations of people um, in the British Empire. Um, and so this card counting technology or the, this punch card technology was in use um, for, for quite a number of years into the 60s and 70s. Um, I remember talking to my father one time um, about when he was in university during the late 60s um, and, and, and he was earning his MBA and he told me about how he took his computer classes in MBA and, and he would just, he would go to a, a room with a stack of punch cards that he had spent hours punching holes in for, you know, gathering accounting data. And then he would give those punch cards to somebody. And then he would come back like a week later and he would have the results on some kind of data output on a hard copy. Um, and his big stack of punch cards, they'd give back to him. So if there was an error on the punch card, then you had to start all over again, right? The next week, so you'd get the cards back and they'd tell you where the error was or errors. And then you'd go back and you'd fix your punch cards and then you'd bring them back again and you'd give them to the guy. And then you come back in another week and see. And he said that's basically how you use computers um, for accounting during the 60s as well. So this punch card technology has been around, um, you know, into the digital age even. Okay. And now we get into the era that many of us are most familiar with. Um, and that's the digital era, the era, the era with software. Um, and so we get into digital computing and Microsoft Windows. I mean, I'm jumping over a lot, of course, but 
um, you get the point on that. And and the digital era starts, I would say, sometime in the late 60s, early 70s, um, with the introduction of semiconductors and, and the building of personal computers. Okay, and now um, after talking, I'm gonna show a, a video here. Um, it's a brief history of the internet. And it is pretty brief. It's a good, it's a good video. Um, it's animated. I think, you'll, I think you'll enjoy the video. And it does give a good, concise history um, of the internet. Starting from sometime in the 1960s, and it runs until sometime in the early 90s, I think that is the time period the video um, talks about. Okay, so I'm going to start the video, and I'm going to let it run for about 10 seconds, and then hit pause. Let me know if you're having a problem seeing or hearing it. Okay, um, it appears the video is playing fine. Everyone's able to hear it and see it. I'm going to let it play. I hope you enjoy it. The internet is the global communication network that allows almost all computers worldwide to connect and exchange information. But how did the internet get started? More than 1 billion people worldwide use the internet. The internet is used for shopping, listening to music, watching TV and movies, searching for information, and communicating with people around the world. The internet originated in the late 1960s when the United States Defense Department developed ARPANET, the Advanced Research Projects Agency Network an experimental network of computers designed to guarantee communication in the case of a nuclear attack. The birth of the ARPANET project was in 1962 by J.C.R. Licklinder of MIT. Licklinder thought up a globally connected world where people could quickly access data and programs from any location. In October 1972, ARPANET was shown up to a large audience and a very hot tool that the network could use called email was introduced. ARPANET email was pioneered in March 1972 by Ray Tomlinson at BBN. Email was a fantastic advancement in communication over the phone and allowed the early creators of the internet to discuss and document in great detail the actual development of the network. In the mid-1980s, when desktop computer workstations became increasingly popular, organizations wanted to connect their aerial networks or LANs to ARPANET. January 1st, 1983 is considered the official birth date of the internet. Prior to this, the various computer networks did not have a standard way to communicate with each other. Internet technology protocols were developed, commonly known as TCP IP or Transmission Control Protocol and Internet Protocol. This led to one of the first definitions of the internet being a connected set of networks. ARPANET and the Defense Data Network officially changed to the TCP IP standard on January 1st, 1983, hence the birth of the Internet. To help speed up connections, the National Science Foundation established supercomputing centers in 1986, creating the NSFNet. NSFNet continued to grow, and more and more countries around the world connected. During the late 1980s, the first Internet service provider companies were formed. Companies like PSINet and UUNet were formed to provide service to the regional research networks and provide alternate network access to the public. 1991 was a big year for the Internet. The National Research and Education Network, or NRENS, was founded and the World Wide Web was released. The Internet was still dominated by scientists and other academics, but public interest was largely increased. With the release of the Mosaic Web Browser in 1993, and Netscape in 1994, interest in and use of the World Wide Web exploded. More and more communities became wired, enabling direct connections to the internet. The internet continues to experience staggering growth. 
More people use the internet to get connected to others, find information, conduct business, and share information more than ever before in history. So what's next? What's the future for the internet? Well, while the answer isn't entirely clear, the possibilities are very exciting. Okay, so I think um, what that video shows, it, and it gives us an idea of, of this kind of telescoping nature of information technology, right? So if you look at the period of time in the first era from roughly 3000 BC to 1450 AD, um, and then you look at the next period of time from 1450 AD to about 18, 1840, right? And then you look at from 1840, you know, for the digital era to start in the 1940s and then to the Internet period, you see how as information technology, um, when there was these big leaps in technology, the time period for the next wave became closer and became newer. Um, and so... Uh, the next era of technology, the next era of internet, um, of, of information technology is, is coming. I mean, the foundations are being laid right now for it. Um, and so I think it'll be quite interesting um, when it does happen, when we do make that leap from the internet into some kind of other mega network, you know, worldwide network. So now we're going to slow down a little bit. We talked a little bit about the history of information technology. Um, and now we're going to get into some current technologies used in business. Okay. Um, I think the, the first one, the one we should start with, is telecommunication. Um, telecommunication is the most basic form um, of business communication. Um, and that's talking to someone on the phone. Um, I think for years that was considered the stereotypical businessman's tool, right? So if you look, so for example, if you were to watch a movie about a businessman in the 1930s, for example, um, they would be using a telephone. If you looked at a movie about a businessman in the 1950s, um, they're going to be using a telephone, the same in the 60s, the 70s. In the 80s, they're going to be using cell phones, right, um, and car phones. And in the 90s, they're going to be using smartphones and earpieces. And you're going to see, um, you're going to see in the history, in, in our culture, that the interconnectedness of telecommunication and business. Um, and so having communication skills over the phone um, and, and having access to the telephone um, has become rather ubiquitous um, in the business world. Uh, so, for example, um, I have telephone numbers in, you know, for my business in the United States in you know taiwan south korea malaysia um china and japan um but all of those numbers either ring through to my skype phone here in thailand or to my cell phone here in thailand um i would say you know 15 20 years ago it either would have been quite expensive or nearly impossible to do that um and now i do this with 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 ease um and, and and it doesn't cost me too much more you know than what a phone bill a single phone phone you know for a landline phone cost in the united states 20 years ago and yet i have five different phone numbers in five different countries that all ring to a single number wherever i'm at so like if i decide to change my phone or go to a different country 
Um, and like, let's say, for example, I decided to move to India or something. Um, I could just pop out my Thailand SIM card, put in my India SIM card, and then basically just transfer my phone calls all to the India phone. And I could do that probably with most phone networks in the world. So um, it is quite interesting um, how much time and how much communication that we can do on the phone. Um, you know, and, and it's not just for business, too. It's also for personal use. And so the use of telecommunication, the use of telephony has become ubiquitous in the modern world. Um, people can use it for business. I mean, you have been, I've even met business people who tell me they refuse to use the phone. They refuse to talk on the phone. Um, and so 20 years ago, if you said you, if you said you were a businessman and you refused to talk on the phone, um, you wouldn't be a businessman very long. Um, and so because of its ubiquity, um, it's become something that we now take advantage of. But just, you know, just in, in, you know, just in recent time, it was very complicated to use um, more than one telephone at one time or more than one telephone system. Okay. Uh, and now let's talk a little bit about portable devices such as smartphones and tablets. Um, these are such really powerful devices that we can use and handle simple communication um, and contact information and track things and provide feedback no matter where we are. Um, these are strong tools that can be used for business and, and for maintaining the continuity of business um, during off hours, over weekends. Um, there's such a wide variety of functions they can fill. Um, and they're not even fulfilling all of the information technology needs that we have because smartphones, tablets, um, these kinds of things, they are still designed to consume technology um, and consume content, but they haven't really been utilized or designed to generate technology or, or, or to generate content. Um, and so as soon as these devices can generate content, so what I mean by generate content is if you want, if you're on your smartphone and you have a small, I don't know, five inch screen, um, it might be a little difficult to write and edit a one page email to somebody. Um, however, if you had the technology to dictate to your phone, the e the one page email you wanted to send, um, or say for example, you could dictate to your phone, you could say something to your phone. Uh, yes, I'd like to write an email to, and then give the name of the person, and I would like the email to have this theme, this theme, and this information. Can you generate a one page email for me? And then the computer, the phone, whatever generates that email for you, and then sends it for you, right? So. We're not quite at that point yet with the technology. So we're still learning to consume content with these devices. And there's been inroads to generate technology. Um, you know, there you use Google Docs um, and Google Spreadsheets and, um, you know, a lot of the other software companies and, and software platforms that have been created to duplicate what Google Docs does. Um, you can also use Microsoft Word um, on many devices now um, and Microsoft Excel. And, and you can use a lot of these things on many of these smaller devices. But if you ask me, they're limited because of the screen size and then the lack of a keyboard um, or some kind of weird thumb typing technology or something like that. Um, and so we're still a bit away from the content generation that you're still capable of with a laptop or a desktop computer, but that you don't necessarily get with a smartphone or a, a tablet. Okay, I'd like to take a short 10-minute break here. Um, Okay, so we're going to take a short 10 minute break. And then when I come back, we're going to discuss robotics as information technology.
Okay. I'm coming back from the break now. If you need a little longer, let me know. Uh, otherwise, I'll just go ahead and get started. Okay. Let's go ahead and move on to the next slide. And now we're going to move into um, talking about robotics as an information technology. Um, in, in my opinion, the next phase of the information technology, the next big wave, the next thing is going to make our lives easier um, is going to be robotics. Um, and not robotics as we currently, you know, not as robotics as the current state of the technology that we have it, but robotics in that um, robotics will, robots will start doing a lot of the things that people can do. Um, in, the, in the near future, I would say sometime between now and, and 2050, um, there's going to be advances in um, the thinking abilities of robots uh, and artificial intelligence. Um, and so robots are going to do many of the things that people do now in business, um, such as talking to customers to take orders, um, you know, w working as assistants, gathering marketing data. A lot of this kind of thing is going to, is going to, advance as robots um, and robot technology um, increases um, its ability. And so basically, I just want to talk a little bit about the basics of robotics and a little bit about um, how robotics is uh, an extension of information technology. And so we'll start with a Robotics in its current state is an engineering science and technology of robots and includes their design, manufacture, application, and structural disposition. Robotics is related to electronics, mechanics, and software. Okay. Um, and so right now the current state is that robots can really do um, a lot based on their program instructions and how they are programmed to use. And a lot of robots, even though more and more robots are being built, a lot of robots have um, develop, you know, are developing multi-purpose multi uses instead of the single-purpose robot that we think about. Okay. Um, right now, most robots are designed to move material, parts, tools, or specialized devices through a program set of motions and to perform tasks. Okay. Well, I think in the future, um, it's going to change much more than that. Um, right now, they're designed to move material, parts, tools, and specialized devices. Um, I think in the in in the near term, in the in the longer term. Um, they're going to be doing those things that they're moving materials, parts, and tools for now. So now they move material from one place to another for people, or they move parts or tools or specialized devices for one place to another place so that a human being on each end can do it. Well, I think that is going to largely go away, and robots are going to be able to do everything along the business chain. and human beings are going to be more part of business in the sense that they're going to oversee um, robots, control robots, perform maintenance. Those kinds of things will be done on the on the actual robots by people. Um, and, and that's what business people are going to do in, 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 a, in a number of ways. I'm only describing it generally, but the, the specifics, um, the details are unknown right now. So um, some of the things that robots can do now um, is very rudimentary. They can do things such as um, for pick and place operations. These are industrial robots who perform 
what are referred to as pick and place operations. Among the most common of these operations is loading and unloading pallets. Um, and they are used across a broad range of industries. Okay. Um, but there are quite some big advantages even, even now in terms of pick and place operations. Um, I would say sometime last month, I edited a, a paper for an academic researcher in Taiwan who basically had designed or was designing um, a robot to move on a wired grid system in a warehouse, um, both vertically and horizontally um, using robotics. Um, and it was really quite interesting how um, the robot would learn the patterns for specific, you know, the software would learn the patterns for specific um, requests or requests from a certain person. So when that person asked for something, the robot would already start moving in that direction based on the voice of that person. I mean, it was a, it was pretty interesting research. Um, I think one of the things that most people imagine um, when they think about robots in business is they imagine them in the assembly line um, as being part of a chain of something that builds um, something, right? So this from one machine, then this machine puts another part, then this machine puts another part, et cetera, et cetera, until the, 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 the whole thing is put together at the end. Um, and I think that's generally how most robotics is being used currently. Um, and then the next thing is um, some spray finishing operations. Robots are very um, useful for spray finishes because um, they can be used in such a way um, that they can, you know, that they can go and they can use very hazardous chemicals with lots of fumes, right? Um, and the, the company doesn't have to spend as much money on safety and safety devices for people who would have to spray um, those kinds of things. And, and, and also, too, there, there's, there's a lot of money in terms of saving um, by spraying coats because the robots will only be a certain distance away um, and there won't be as much waste or spillage or anything uh, from the spray finishing operations. And so those are, those are just some of the ways um, that robots are being currently used and, and how their use is going to expand from there outwards. And some other robotic mechanical type uses um, that we see today is the barcode reader. Um, barcode readers are very common in warehouse technology and, and moving inventory and keeping track of inventory um, but they even have some use on the consumer end as well um, for, for example when I'm you know at a bookstore buying books oftentimes what I'll do is to find out more information about the book or to see if I already own it as an ebook or something I'll scan the ISBN number on the back of the book into my smartphone and then look up the ISBN number through a search engine um, and find out the history of the book and, and see if I, if I happen to own any of the versions of the book or, or that kind of thing. Um, additionally, there's also marketing opportunities from certain barcodes. Like, um, I'm not sure where you live, but I know in Asia you see a lot of these kind of round barcodes like at 7-Eleven and Family Mart and convenience stores and supermarkets. And if you point your phone at those and you um, you read those round barcodes, usually it opens up some kind of web page or some kind of software application um, as well. And, and that's all barcode related technology. Um, and I think it's something that we use um, and it's quite useful. Um, Years ago, when I was working as a warehouse manager in an AV company, an audiovisual company in Las Vegas, um, the company went to um, at what at the time was called an all-digital warehouse. Um, and basically, we had um, what were called steel-backed stickers. And the steel-backed stickers, we'd print out a barcode, 
and then we stick the sticker onto the audio visual device <clears throat> and then we scan it into the computer with the barcode the serial number of the device um, and we link those up with the maintenance history um, the transportation history etc so we were uh, we were able to track all of the equipment using barcodes um, where it goes, how long it was gone for, when it came back into the warehouse, et cetera. Um, and it was really um, quite useful. Um, and with by implementing the barcode system, um, we were able to use barcodes um, to essentially manage the warehouse and it, we essentially went from having 20 warehouse managers um, to having five regional warehouse managers. Um, and by the downsizing of warehouse managers and the tracking of the equipment, we were actually able to um, identify uh, one of the satellite offices committing a huge amount of, of fraud um, by taking, you know, by moving equipment around, et cetera trying to move it outside the system um, so it was quite useful and it was really um, it was really i mean it was a really great advance at the time okay um atm machines um now i use this picture because it's a it, it, there's not a lot of visual representation of ATM machines or automatic banking machines um, available. So um, I found this picture on the internet, um, but there's a lot of tangential technology, information technology that's being used um, in terms of banking other than just taking money and checking balances. Okay. Okay. And then here's a quick video on robotics in business I'm going to dump the link here in the app window and then I'm going to start the YouTube video if you have a hard time seeing or hearing the video let me know it's not a long video my name is Matt Rendell I'm the CEO and co-founder of ClearPath Robotics we build unmanned. Okay. Um, if anyone's having a hard time seeing or hearing the video, let me know. Otherwise, I'm going to let the video play. And vehicles to automate the world's dullest, deadliest, and dirtiest jobs. I got into unmanned vehicles during my time at the University of Waterloo. Myself and my business partners, we were studying mechatronics engineering, and in our spare time, we found ourselves at the UW Robotics team. So we would be uh, hanging out in the robotics lab, building robots for fun, really developed a passion for it and figured after we graduated, let's turn this into a business. I would have to say we were entrepreneurs before we were inventors. And, and the reason for that is we, we started the business with some ideas and we had built robots before and that, that is invention, but we scrapped it very early on because we knew that we needed to find a viable business, not focus on the invention itself and we went out to the market and we spoke with customers. We spoke with as many people as would spend time on the phone with us to learn about their problems, the challenges that they were facing in their business, what kinds of technology they were currently using, and, and try and figure out where robotics could fit into the equation for them. And so we, we invented after um, we were entrepreneurs. There's, there's innovation and then there's what the customer needs. And they're not always connected. A great lesson learned there was we were working on a, on a certain feature for one of our products for a long time and we knew that this was cutting edge, it was better than anything else on the market, it was very advanced, it was a robotic boat that could drive itself and so you put it in the water, you press go and it does its thing and then returns back to shore. The customer didn't want that and all they needed was a remote control and that's a lesson that we learned in terms of, uh, of innovation and commercializing that you need to validate 
the customer requirements very, very early on. If you leave a bunch of really smart engineers in a room to innovate, they will push the envelope so far because that's what they're designed to do. That's what they live and breathe. But you also need to make sure you keep customer requirements in check because quite often you'll, you'll pass the bar. Okay, so that was a pretty interesting video. And, and what I liked about that video is how um, he talks about finding robots, using them for business, um, and determining um, user rules and what the user wants, even though they've come up with a great product. Um, they had to come up with another way um, to sell it, right? Because you could have the best product in the world, and if nobody buys it, um, you're not going to be in business very long. Um, and so I thought that was interesting, um, an interesting aspect, an interesting way to think about robotics and robotics in business and, and, and how, as an industry, that it's growing. Um, and now we're going to get in and start talking about something very, very specific. Um, and we're going to talk about applications, um, specific applications in use in the business world um, and in different areas. Um, and so let's go ahead and start right in. <clears throat> um, I, IT in accounting and finance. Um, and spreadsheets. This is probably the area, um, this is probably the program that most people in IT use and help users use, and that's spreadsheets. I'm using Excel in particular, um, but lots of different kinds of databases, flat file databases, relative databases, relational databases, etc. Um, as a manager, as a business owner, um, the use of spreadsheets for a variety of purposes in a variety of different areas is essential. Um, I bet you on, on, on an average business day, I use anywhere from seven to ten standard um, spreadsheets on a regular basis, and I probably use another five to five to ten temporary um, temporary use spreadsheets. Um, for a variety of reasons, and I even use some spreadsheets just as a calculator. Um, I'll just basically open up the spreadsheet and tabulate a single item and then just delete it or erase it, not even save it. So um, I think for most people in business, spreadsheets are the most common tool um, for use. Um, even though their use started out in accounting and finance, um, I think everybody uses them for a variety of reasons. Even w one of the things that I noticed in working for companies is that even when a company has a, a really nice CRM system or a really nice ERP system, um, oftentimes managers will want the ability to extract data for some reason out of the CRM system or out of the ERP system into Excel. 
Um, so they can do some kind of manipulation within the spreadsheet, even when that um, manipulation, you know, the, the, the ability to manipulate data is the same in the ERP system or the CRM system. Um, people just don't trust it um, until they can put it into an Excel spreadsheet and play around with the formulas themselves. Um, and this is something that I've seen in myself. I've seen it in just about every company I've worked with, just about every manager I've worked with, is the importance of spreadsheets in, in any business. Um, not just in accounting and financing, but in everything from human resources management. Um, okay, so speaking of Excel, um, the next two videos um, are basically a history of Excel. Um, it's a video, this it's a two part video produced by Microsoft. Um, and I think you'll enjoy it. And, and there's lots of information technology um, going on in these videos in terms of the creation of the software, the history of the software, um, and, and the impact that Excel has had um, on the business world in general. Um, I'm going to let the video, I'm going to start the video and let it play for 10 seconds and I'll quickly pause it. Um, let me know if you have a hard time seeing or hearing the video. Okay, uh, let me know if you're having a hard time seeing or hearing the video. Okay, I'm gonna let the video play. I hope you enjoy it. I learned about this company up in Bellevue called Microsoft. They were talking about um, application software. There was this inkling of, yeah, you know, they were going to develop a spreadsheet product and a word processing product. I was very impressed by the um, idea of software as a business, software being separated from hardware. I believed in software, and when I came to Microsoft, my first job was to be the product manager on a product called Multiplan. Multiplan was distinguished by an extreme degree of portability. In the early days of personal computers, there was really quite a large number of different computers that came onto the market uh, using different processors, using different architectures. So our bet at that time was on diversity, on, on being able to run on as many different uh, computers as possible. And probably Multiplan was, was one of the most ported applications of all time. At, at one point, we were running on 50 different computers. Now, Multiplan didn't do as well as we wanted it to do. It did reasonably well in international markets, but not so well in the US market. It was because we got leapfrogged by a product called Lotus 123. When I started in 84, uh, the spreadsheet market was virtually 100% MS DOS and Lotus 123. They had completely dominant market share, not just for spreadsheets, but they were the by far the most dominant app, I think, in, in the software, PC and software industry. After we saw how successful Lotus 123 was, we were kicking off the next generation of our spreadsheet, the project that would ultimately replace Multiplan. And the initial code name for that project was Odyssey. Ultimately, that's what became Microsoft Excel. Now, most people don't know that when Odyssey was kicked off in October of 1983, it was focused on being a better spreadsheet than Lotus 1-2-3 on the PC, not on graphic user interface. And so a brilliant programmer named Doug Clunder had figured out how to do the calculation algorithm in two dimensions simultaneously so that we could recalculate even faster than Lotus 1-2-3. By the spring of 1984, Bill and I were convinced that we really needed to bet on graphic user interface. And so we made a tough decision. We went to the team and said that we're going to shift from doing Odyssey on the PC and instead 
focus its initial release on the Apple Macintosh and then ultimately on Microsoft Windows. Excel did tremendously. The group under the leadership of Jeff Harbors, they did a, a fantastic job and worked day and night, including the, the night before release. What we focused on was you know, productivity, ease of use, being able to do things quickly. And the advantage of being in the Windows environment, having a GUI environment, we had drag and drop, you know, things like copy paste worked a lot easier in, in the new environment than they did in the DOS environment. That was really the important thing at that time to move software from, you know, PhD thesis kind of uh, user mode into something that, that an average person could use. Plus, just uh, look. You know, the look and experience was just fantastic compared to DOS. Instead of just having character-based, you know, everything's just text. You know, you have graphics. Things look better. They feel better. When you say something is bold, you can actually display it as bold as opposed to a different color. And, you know, underlining everything is more WYSIWYG. A fantastic advantage there. And then just the interface with the mouse and the first toolbars. On the Mac side, uh, we were not toiling in obscurity at all. Um, you know, we are clearly the number one, but in the, in the complete PC market, you know, we were single digits for a long, long time. It was Jeff Rakes and Pete Higgins' idea to, to bundle all of those products into a single package. And it was a fairly non-obvious or even scary thing to do that. You and I take that for granted today, but in the late 1980s, people thought that was a sort of a brain dead idea. I always believed that we should package them together. And so in the late 1980s, first with the Macintosh, I believe in 1988, and then with Windows in 1990, we put together the Office suite of applications. And really at that point in time it was just a bundle of standalone applications, but ultimately of course we got better and better and better at, at bringing the products together. Well, I really enjoyed the 95 release. We were switching from 16-bit Excel to 32-bit Excel. So there was a lot of a lot of work that we needed to do just to get just to get Excel to boot again on this new Windows. It was a new thing, it was 32-bit. It was supposed to be the great new world. We wanted to feel that way and perform that way. So it was targeted around performance and the new look and feel of Windows 95. Because PCs were actually able to run more than one program at a time effectively, because of the 386, because of you know multi-megabytes of memory, the notion that all the programs should work the same way became really important. After Office 95 and, and Windows 95 came out, we went to far majority share. It was just a great, great release. Great release for the, you know, for the whole PC industry. When you think about the, the longevity of Excel is amazing. We had this incredible ethos about being really efficient in how we programmed Excel, which I think is a, an excellent long-term fundamental. You would think um, that there wouldn't be any code in Excel from you know, 15, 20, 30 years ago, but a lot of it still lives. Every now and then you, you, you're working in some code and you want to find out, okay, when did this rule should get changed and why, and you look back through the history. And sometimes you just keep having to look back and back, and it'll, it'll go back to 1990 or 19, you know, 87 or something. But there's a lot of history in the code. So I just dropped the link for part two in there, and I'm going to go ahead and start the second video right away. I hope you enjoy it. It 
it was a product that Microsoft built from the ground up, started off as an underdog and had unparalleled success and, and is now you know, a true mission critical part of most businesses across the world. I never know how people are using Excel because it's used in so many different ways. I think it's sort of a friendlier way to, to look at, do some number crunching, if you will. Excel actually changed the way business works really by making it easy for people to use and to be able to make decisions and do calculations and put charts on their data. We have financial companies that use it to crunch vast amounts of data to run simulations so they can help determine what's going to happen in the world. They don't just use Excel as a the tool for uh, writing forms. They actually build solutions on top of Excel, things that have been running for 10, 15 years. We work with companies to make sure those things keep running with every new version of Excel. And these are critical, critical applications for their business that they need to keep their business running to stay ahead of their competitors. I mean, not a day goes by where people don't have to make some sort of a decision and categorize their information in some meaningful way. And Excel just does it in a, in a way that's accessible to, to most people. You can't imagine where, where people have been empowered to start their own business because they have that at their fingertips. Excel has expanded to onto the web with the Excel web application and 2010 was a big release where we brought a lot of functionality onto the web where now you can just do a lot of Excel in the browser. You don't need the client app, you can do editing, you can do collaboration, you can do a lot of what we call one version of the truth. With a server product, you publish it onto the server. That's where it lives. There's only one place where that document lives as opposed to as an attachment in 500 emails. I worked a lot on our calc code, our recalc engine, and our, our dependencies. Worked a lot on our conditional formatting code, which has been a feature that's been around for a while, but we, we really um, added a lot to a lot of different, different styles and really expanded that feature. Uh, we spent a lot of time trying to improve our performance, and, and I think we made great strides there. Went to a bigger grid and our 64-bit Excel, and these are things we hadn't done in terms of expanding the grid to that dimension. So where people say, oh, Excel's an old code base, you can't do these big changes. And you know, we say, you know what, we do them. And we do them all the time, and we're going to keep doing them. It's software. We can do whatever we want. If we go back to the beginning of Excel 25 years ago to now, there's been incredible transformation in terms of how people communicate. There's a lot more collaboration going on in the world. Corporations and organizations have a lot of information or data that's in back-end systems, and we need to be able to empower people to look at that data, twist it around, analyze it, pivot it, and examine it in different ways so that they can uncover some insights. So Excel plays a tremendous role in the whole business intelligence world by virtue of the fact that it's the tool that people use. It's the one that they actually touch. We think that we should be delivering a datagasmic experience to people. So if we think about Excel in, in the world where people have cell phones and they have all different kinds of mobile devices and they work in browsers and they have their PCs, you know, there's a version of Excel that pretty much runs on any device. If we look at what's out there today, we have the web application which allows people to use Excel on any machine that doesn't have to have any software installed on it. And in that way, you can bring together a wide variety of groups who can work on a single spreadsheet at the same time, but the people that are working on it could be all over the world using whatever form factor is convenient for them. People are going to want to be able to get at their data no matter where they are. They want to be able to get it anything, anytime. And so we look at the cloud as, as a repository for these numbers, and then teams can work no matter where they are around the world, aiming at this one particular document that sits in the cloud. It's what makes it really accessible to people. So it doesn't matter whether you're sitting on the airplane with your Wi-Fi connection on your laptop, or at a coffee shop with an internet connection, or if you're on your phone. You know, all these people, no matter where they are and what form factors they're using, they can access that same piece of data in the cloud. There's ways of presenting the data to people in ways that they haven't even been able to imagine yet. Excel is one of the most successful products in the history of, of software. Excel is, I think, it's really boundless because we've always been able to morph it into 
being able to have different capabilities that maybe weren't traditionally thought of as part of a spreadsheet. You know, there are these transitions in the industry and you have to be able to ride those transitions in order to stay on top. The thing that keeps me excited about Excel is it's still constantly changing. There's never a release where I feel like, oh, we're done, let's quit. Sitting next to a person on the plane and started talking and they literally grabbed me by the shirt. You work on Excel? I love Excel. People love Excel. <laughs>
Well, anyway, to make a you know to to help the story along, we posted the ad in the India Times, and then basically within the first week, we went from getting five or six inquiries a day um, to getting fifty to a hundred a day, um, and it was so effective. Um, However, we were only using email. We didn't have a, we, we had to build an information, you know, technology type system to deal with our human resources because we, prior to that, we were just dealing with much small numbers, you know, like what's the point of implementing a whole entire system um, when you just have to keep track of 20 or 30 people, right? You could just do that with a simple spreadsheet. You didn't really need some kind of system. So after the first week or so, um, I realized that there was no way I was going to be able to keep up with the volume of emails um, and applications I was getting. There's no way I was going to be able to scrutinize, send out tests, ask people questions, and hire editors with as many um, responses as we were getting. So um, over the weekend, what I did was is um, I installed a computer program um, on a cloud server called Sugar CRM, um, the Community Edition, um, and then basically Sugar CRM is essentially a content um, a, a, a contact resource management system. Um, basically, it, it, it's primarily used as a sales tool, as a marketing tool. Um, so. What I did was I set it up, and then basically I created web forms um, in our Drupal website. Um, and then basically what I did was is I just went in and then I customized all the menus in Sugar CRM using the back end. They have a menu editing program, and basically I customized all of the menus and uh, you know what we're going to call this and what we're going to call that. And essentially, in about 72 hours, I ported the program and used it as kind of a makeshift HRM system um, that had all you know it had the ability for me to contact and categorize and you know save documents. It had a rudimentary um, document management system built into it. Um, and basically, we were able then to receive and start ferreting out the people we wanted to maybe hire. Um, we, we were able to fare and start grouping people together into groups. Okay, we want to send thank you but no thank you emails to this group of people. We want to send editing tests in medical science to these people and engineering tests to these people, et cetera. Um, and so we were able to branch out our tests into a variety of fields. Um, and we were able to streamline the communication so we could deal with the influx of um, candidates who, from India who are interested in working for us from our India Times ad. Um, it was really, really, uh, to me, wh when that happened, it really showed the importance of um, having an IT system in place um, for um, human resources. Um, and uh, it was, it was, I mean, to be honest with you, we, you know, there, there, there became a cutoff point, even with the CRM system, where we just stopped taking any more applications about 20 days into the 90 days after we had posted the ad. Okay. Um, tracking market share. Um, this isn't something I know a lot about, so I'll just have to glaze over it. Um, but Essentially, we can get day-to-day -day information about markets worldwide, currency markets, stock markets, commodity markets, commodity pricing, et cetera. Um, and that can be used um, in a variety of information tracking systems um, to keep track. Um, for me, one of the things that I use, that, that I track regularly is currency markets because um, I'm taking payments from a variety of people in a variety of countries and a variety of currencies. And so I like to keep track um, of the currencies, on, not necessarily on a daily basis, though I could if I wanted to, but more on a weekly or a bi-weekly basis. 
Um, and the reason is, is because I offer um, people the ability to pay in the local currency. And so I need to keep an eye on the currencies in case a clever customer figures out if they pay this week in um, Malaysian money um, that they'll save 5% than if they pay in US dollars or something. So I keep track of currencies, you know, at, at least the currencies I generally get papers from customers in. Okay. Now the advantages of IT, um, there are many advantages. Um, and in this list, there are also many disadvantages as well. Um, I don't like to think in terms of advantages and disadvantages. I think sometimes things, there's, there's advantages to everything and there are disadvantages to everything. Um, but one of the things that I saw in most of the literature that people said was a disadvantage in IT was that um, it pulls people out of the office. It pulls people from working together as a collective in an office environment. Um, for me, I see this pulling people out of the office um, and working in environments that they choose to work in being a much greater advantage. Um, in my experience, in having worked in the same industry, both in, in brick and mortar companies and in virtual companies, um, I think the work day is a lot more efficient in my industry um, in a virtual company than it is in an office environment. Um, and so I don't see not working in an office environment as being a disadvantage to IT. So I'm just trying to presage how some of these advantages and disadvantages are going to be discussed in lecture. Okay. So I think what's considered the best or the greatest advantage is connectivity, okay? Um, IT systems can connect us to a lot of people um, faster um, and reach a lot more people than we can even conceive of. So if you remember the example I gave about posting the job ad in the India Times, um, right? We, you know, me and the director of the, at the company, we had assumed because the price was so low to post for 90 days in the Times of India that we were to get a low response because um, the, 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 the majority of the ads we were placing were very expensive and we had minimal response. So we had made the assumption that... Um, the more money we spend on connectivity and posting ads, the more candidates we would get. Well, actually, it turned out, at least in this instance, not to be true, right? The least amount of money brought on the greatest number of people responding to our ad um, and looking for work. Um, because of that amount of connectivity, it just shows that you need to be ready um in in today's business world in you know internet connected with connections the way they are in with technology that you have to be ready for that influx um that may arise from a job ad somewhere or a advertising campaign or an email marketing campaign or something if you don't have the IT systems in place um, you could really lose out on a lot of the revenue and advantages um, that these things provide. So even though connectivity is generally seen as an advantage, if you don't have the money or expertise um, to set up IT system to, de to deal with that influx of business, um, then you could actually be doing your business a lot of long-term harm. Okay, so another video on connectivity.
Pam, let the video play for 10 seconds. Let me know if you have any problems seeing or hearing it. As science and technology has progressed, and as we've learned more and more about our... Okay, can everyone see and hear the video? Okay, I'm going to let it play through. ...universe, it's become increasingly apparent that the human species is simply one of many insignificant life forms here on this small, small planet. A pale blue dot, as Carl Sagan would say. But even before all the scientific discovery and the space exploration, surely our ancestors experienced some form of insignificance when they looked up at the vast expanse of starry sky. And what I mean by insignificance is that we're not the center of the universe. Humans are the only creatures that care about humans. We're limited by nature, and for some, we have an innate inferiority to a higher power. But regardless of what you believe or don't believe, we've all had the same questions about our existence come to mind. Like, why are we here? And what is the meaning of life, if any? And while I cannot answer that question for you, I can offer my observations as to how people go about answering that question. Because humans need connectedness to fight the meaninglessness. We need to feel a connection to find a sense of purpose. It's something secure in the uncertainty. It allows for intimacy in a world that's too large for us to handle alone. We love being in groups and we proudly wear the labels that they provide us with. We've seen the power of movements with Martin Luther King and Gandhi and Adolf Hitler because Groups provide this comforting sense of belonging, and somehow your identity and passions mean more when you share them with a lot of people. And we just like connecting with people in general. I mean, family, friends, and even pets help keep us happy. Low social connectedness is linked to depression, which is linked to suicide, which sucks. And even religious hermits and monks that lead secluded lives in prayer, they find this deep connection with nature, or God, or whatever other gods that they believe in. And that fuels them with purpose. But you don't need to be a monk to feel at one with the universe. I mean, the science behind how everything works is enough to realize how much in common you have with everything. Like, all matter is made out of atoms, and 99% of your DNA is identical to that of a chimpanzee's. And the cycles that we see in nature, I mean, the, we're part of that energy flow and, and cycling of nutrients. If you decided to be directly buried into the ground, your atoms would be used to support the growth of new organisms. You're just a small part of the circle of life. But as small as we are, we are capable of connecting to things that are greater than ourselves to help us feel a little bit more significant. And personally, as one of the 7 billion people living with 9 million other species on this very small planet orbiting just one of the 200 billion stars in this whole galaxy, which is just one of billions and billions of galaxies in this ever-expanding universe, any sense of significance is more than enough to keep me going. Okay, so you're probably asking yourself, what does this video um, have to do with the lecture? Um, and essentially, one of the things, if you've been in my other lectures, one of the things I like to talk about is human needs. And in, in IT, in information technology, and in business in general, it's very easy. Um, to forget that the point of all this information technology, um, sharing information, making it available, um, is because it meets human needs. It meets our ability um, to connect. Okay. Um, and because of that, um, we need to realize that at the end of every information communication technology is that there are people that need to be communicated to and with either because we want their business or because they work for us and we need to communicate with them and so i think it's really important that we always consider um the human needs and not get caught up in the technology and think about um why we're communicating with people. Why are we using SMS? Why are we using email? Why are we using webinars and these kinds of things? Um, and the idea is, is that we want to connect more um, 
for business and how to utilize these technologies. And so you need to ask yourself, um, in using a, a communication technology, who am I communicating with and why am I communicating with them? Um, when you do this, this is sometimes called a needs analysis or a stakeholders analysis, and you're figuring out what people know and what people need to share and what people want to share. Um, it's important that people want to feel connected. So people have to communicate somehow, okay? They don't have to be in the same office. They don't have to be in the same room, but they need to talk somehow. Maybe it's over the telephone. Maybe it's via Skype. You know, I am chatting. Maybe it's a video chat. Maybe it's a combination of all of these things. However, the thing is, is you need to figure out. You need to make those connections, and and that was the point of this video of what the advantage of information technology is, is that this connectivity that we now have, this digital connectivity that we now have, um, allows us to meet many human needs that could only have been met one way before can now be met in many different ways in a variety of communication channels. Okay. So let's get into some of the other advantages. Um, one of the other, one of the big advantages to IT in the, the IT market is that Marketing is becomes very cost effective on the internet, um, and being able to market in other countries, in other markets, is a very powerful tool um, for any company. So, if you think of a company twenty years ago that wanted to do business in many countries in Asia, um, you're looking at a very complicated business process, a very complicated way of marketing. Um, you know, you're going to have to set up a representative office with people on the on the ground in in those countries to to do the marketing, to call the people on the phone, etc. Because it just wouldn't be cost effective to do it um, from another country. But now, because of the internet, because of information, you know, because of IT, um, marketing is now very effective and very complex. Um, and it gives you a lot of tools that you can reach different people in a variety of languages. So, for example, if you look at my own marketing, um, I, I, I use an English website, and a website that's all in English. But I market to many academics in many countries in the local language. Um, and the reason why I do that is because... Um, it's very easy for people who don't speak English as their primary language to look at marketing emails as nothing but spam or junk mail. Um, but they can still speak English and use English and, and for business purposes, uh, uh, enough to place an order on a website, right? So that's why I market in the local languages and then have an English-based website. It's much easier that way. And so because of how cost-effective it is, um, for me, almost all of my marketing expense and, and my marketing is email marketing. Um, I've tried other marketing, Google ads and CP, you know, click per ads and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, but my customers just don't respond to the other kinds of marketing. So 95% of, of my marketing budget is email marketing, is monthly, is actually weekly, daily, and monthly marketing, email marketing. Um, and the other 5%, I experiment with what's out there, uh, SEO, um, SEM. I, I get a fair enough response from search engine marketing as well. I would say I get anywhere from two to five percent of my my you know my orders a month from search engine marketing. Um, in terms of the other kinds of marketing, I've I've never had any other channels that were successful. Yeah. 
And so I'm sure that's true for a lot of companies as well. And, and, and the best thing about email marketing is that it actually doesn't cost that much money to do and to start. So, okay. And the reason why I chose this picture is not because I want to talk about this book, even though it is a good book and I highly recommend it if you're, if you're interested, um, is I wanted the words and I liked the picture, um, here. And so one of the main advantages of IT is the ultimate competitive advantage, right? Um, it gives you the ability to completely dominate a market. Um, so, for example, if you look at like Amazon.com, who is in the business of selling everything to everyone all the time, um, they are such a dominant force in the market that even smaller companies have a hard time competing. Um, however, that's not always the case. Um, sometimes smaller companies have other advantages in a niche market um, because they don't need as large a customer base. So they don't need to grow as much, right? They don't need to grow by thousands or millions of customers a year, right? They just grow by 10, 15, 20 customers a year. So um, you have to look at the ultimate competitive advantage in reference to your business and your industry. Um, and the next one you, I think, is one of the most important um, to come up, and that's customer service has, has greatly improved, I think, due to information services. And the reason why is I think the customer centered business um, has become the most popular form of business. I don't think people spend time um, with a business that's not customer centered because they can go somewhere and find that. Um, and I think it's much easier for smaller companies um, to be customer centered. Um, to provide that level of customer service that larger companies can't. Um, so, like, I can give you an example. Um, um, in, for my Office 365 subscription, I was having a hard time making a payment. Um, and so I wanted to call Microsoft on the phone to find out um, why they didn't take the previous month's payment. Um, and I called Microsoft and I mean, it took me 45 minutes of calling around through the phone system before I even got to somebody um, that could even begin to answer my question. <laughs> um, and I'm not saying that their customer service was bad. What I am saying is their customer service was not customer centered, right? Their website was customer centered. Um, but I couldn't find the information I needed. I had to contact somebody. Um, so whereas if a customer were to contact my cust you know, were to contact my company, um, you know, 95% of the time the email or the phone is going to be answered directly by me. So I'm able to help them right away. And if they call back again, I would say there's a 95% chance that they're going to speak directly to me anyway, or at least one of my assistants. Um, who will then speak to me right away. So um, the person that they need to speak to, the person they need to make a decision is not that far removed from what they need for customer service. Um, and, and that's a strong tool. And, and that would not be possible without information technology. And somewhat related to this is e-commerce. Um, e-commerce is the ability to sell to anyone in just about any country, in just about any currency at any time. Um, and so the example that I give is, again, from my company. Um, essentially, I use PayPal as my primary payment provider. Um, and, and, and when I issue an invoice through PayPal, I can put in all the information in English, 
But then if I send the invoice to somebody in China or Taiwan or Malaysia or Japan or the Middle East or something, um, the invoice gets sent in their local language. Um, and then when they want to make a payment, they can go to the local, the local version of the website and make the payment in their local language. And then it comes to me in, you know, and then I get it in English. Um, that's a huge advantage over having to manually translate um, customer, you know, customer invoices, customer responses. So because of these other companies, I'm able to do business in a lot of places in the world in my own language, but I'm able to deal with customers in other languages as well. Um, and I think that's a huge advantage. Um, so an advantage that didn't exist 20 years ago, that's for sure. Okay. Um, worldwide presence. Yes, again, it, it's very easy to establish um, a worldwide presence um, and take payments and have customers from just about everywhere. Um, I mean, I get customers from everywhere, from Europe, you know, from Italy to Middle East to Singapore, to people from a variety of countries studying or working in the United States, Canada, or Europe who want, you know, who, who need academic and editing and translation. Um, and so it's very easy to maintain a worldwide presence, um, which was something that was very complicated and expensive 20 years ago. And then here is um, kind of an order workflow just to show you. And the reason why I put this here is um, you can get very granular with your e-commerce and your marketing procedures. So like, let's say for example, um, the shopping cart. Um, what a lot of um, internet companies realized that what a lot of users do is they'll go to a website and they'll actually start putting items in their shopping cart um, so they can see what the total cost is so they can estimate the shipping um, they can see what kind of credit cards the company takes etc right and so then they'll when they've decided not to make the purchase or maybe they're going to make the purchase later they'll abandon the shopping cart well because of the technology involved with shopping carts and cookies um, a lot of companies record that information and then remarket to that person. So like they'll, they might send an email, you know, you visited our website three days ago and you purchased this item, this, you, you were interested in purchasing this item, this item, and this item. Um, you know, if you're still interested in purchasing these items, we can give you a 20% discount if you purchase these items in the next 24 hours. Um, that's a powerful tool. A lot of people do respond that way. Uh, and the same order forms too. Um, people will place an order, right, and fill out the order form. Um, and then they'll see what the final cost is and everything. And then they'll, okay, they'll abandon the order form. Oh, I'll come back when I get paid next month and pay. And then you can do the same thing, right? And so then you can contact the customer and the customer can start the process over again. And you can remarket to that. These two opportunities, the shopping cart opportunity and the web form opportunity, they didn't essentially exist in the pre-internet era. Like you didn't have it. It would it would require a person to be on the phone quite a bit to get that level of granularity. And, and people just didn't have the, the time because of how slow business moved in the pre-internet era. Um, to this you have these powerful remarketing tools and the next advantage is electronic banking um, accessing your bank accounts anywhere you are in the world from you know from a computer or internet and sending or receiving payments um, while living or anywhere in the world is, is so useful. It's it's unreal how useful it is. Um, 20 years ago, it was quite difficult. I remember um, in the early 90s, I was studying abroad in Germany. And 
I remember outside of Western Union um, receiving money from abroad um, from bank to bank was a real hassle. Like I remember my financial aid check coming from the United States to Germany for when I studied. I remember that taking like three weeks <laughs> for it to come in a bank to bank transfer, a bank to bank wire transfer. It was uh, unbelievably slow and inconvenient. Um, nowadays, I can't even imagine if, 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 if I were to wire money or have someone wire money to me from somewhere in Asia to my bank account here in Thailand, and it took more than three or four days, um, I would think something was wrong with the transaction, um, let alone three weeks. So it just shows how much has changed in terms of electronic banking. Um, I can't even remember the last time I went into a bank branch anywhere in Thailand, in Taiwan, in America. Um, it just is so easy to do everything online that you don't even need to go into the bank branch anymore. So, and you can send and receive payments with such ease because of information technology. Okay, um, search engines for business research. Um, it's getting better, in my opinion, using search engines for business research, but I don't think it's at a point yet where you could really claim that this is an advantage. Um, and the reason why is, is search engines are still filled with information um, for consumers to compare information or find information. It's not necessarily been designed um, yet, even though I guess you could get access to certain databases and stuff like that to do business research. But you still need to apply in a you know to apply a strategy to it. Um, for example, one of the things that I see and talk to people a lot is people will often do a competitive analysis or an analysis that they want to start a business by using information they've gathered from search engines. And the question I would ask is, how do you know that those people who are coming up on the first page of the search engine, how do you know that th that's your competition or that would be your competition? How do you know they would be competitors? Um, just because they're in the same industry doesn't necessarily mean they're, that you are competing for the same market share that they are. Um, and so you can really find a lot of false negatives and true positives um, there are false positives and true negatives in, in, in the setup. Uh, and so you have to be somewhat wary still um, about search engines for business research. Um, however, it can assist you with business research if you already know who your competitors are. And then you want to look up their website and find out what their pricing structures are and place an order and see what their internal processes are and customer service processes. It can help you in that way. Um, being able to plan for travel is a huge, um, it's a huge benefit. Um, for me and for my company, once a year, um, I gather all of my core staff, some of my freelance editors, I gather them all. Um, here in Bangkok for a seven day retreat. Um, and because I can spend a couple of hours researching ticket prices, et cetera, online, I can then go to a travel agent um, and negotiate and, and deal with the travel agent um, and get the lowest prices possible, sometimes even beating the posted website prices um, in dealing with the travel agent because I know what those prices are. Um, that's a huge benefit. And and me being, you know, just having a small company, I'm sure much larger companies can, you know, they they can use it much greater to their advantage. Okay. And now um, more a little bit about um, contact management systems, finding people sharing content, manipulating information, having on websites. Uh, this is something that's quite useful. Um, something that I try and do in my company 
is that um, I often create the website with the pricing information and how the service is going to be performed and what's going to happen first, what's going to happen next, um, and any kind of warranty or guarantee information. Um, I like to keep on the website and I like the staff and the customers to use it and refer to the same information so they have the same knowledge um, when we're discussing orders and taking orders and that kind of thing. Okay. Now we're going to get into the abuses and some of the disadvantages. Um, and, and basically, I think the, the main disadvantage in IT is going to be computer crime, illegal access, um, the illegal interception of information, data information, and systems interference. Um, the first two, um, illegal access and illegal interception, um, are very difficult even for companies to even know they've happened. Um, a lot of time, the crime just completely goes unnoticed. Um, I mean, obviously, if customers can't place orders, you're going to get phone calls and emails. Somebody's going to contact you. Um, at some point, you're going to realize there's been some kind of interference or something like that. But otherwise, you just don't know when these things happen. Oh. Okay, this is a nice little video on cybercrime. I think you'll enjoy it. It's relatively short, if I remember correctly. Yeah, I'll let the video play for 10 seconds, and then I'll pause it and see if anyone has any problems hearing or seeing it. Every day, Thomas works. Okay, so it looks like everyone can hear and see the video fine. I'm going to let it play through. Plays and buys things on the internet. And sometimes he even speaks with his aunt Clarissa. Today, the internet is an integral part of Thomas's life. In fact, the internet is a world of virtually unlimited possibilities for all of us but sadly also for criminals. Every day, they attack our computers, steal our personal and confidential information, or send false messages from banks. That's how Aunt Clarissa lost 600 euros. But cyber criminals also use computers to perpetrate other misdeeds, such as fraud or theft of credit card details. To plan and execute attacks on a large scale, cyber criminals often use botnets, which are networks of compromised personal computers that have been infected by computer viruses. Cyber criminality may affect governments, businesses, and even Thomas's computer. Without even knowing it, Thomas may have already contributed in a small way towards the billions of euros of annual cybercrime profit. He may also have been one of the one million cybercrime victims there are in the world every day. Or his computer may have been infected with one of the 150,000 computer viruses in circulation daily. To avoid that Thomas and his Aunt Clarissa are exposed to these dangers on the net, the EU is developing a common policy to fight borderless cybercriminality. It includes close international cooperation and new, stronger laws, identification and removal of child pornography sites and networks, protection of victims and pursuit of those responsible. Effective partnerships between governments and other public bodies, such as law enforcement authorities and private companies. Criminalizing the creation, use and provision of botnets aimed at attacking information systems. But policies alone are not enough. Thomas knows he must be more careful. He never sends out his credit card details by email, or gives his passwords to anyone, or puts private information freely on the internet. And he always remembers to update his antivirus software. Thanks to the EU policies and his own efforts, Thomas can now surf more securely. He just needs to keep an eye on Aunt Clarissa.
Okay. So that was a pretty uh, short video, and it just shows you um, how prevalent um, cybercrime is um, and, and, and how easy it is for it to go unnoticed. Um, there's a lot of information out there um, on what goes on for cybercrime. And, and the reason why um, it's important, and I bring it up in this lecture, is because with all IT systems, um, security has to be maintained. Um, I mean, the idea is, is that you want your customers to have access to information. And you want your staff to have access to information. But you also, you have to protect that information from people you don't know about who may have another nefarious purpose for that information. So the point of talking about cybersecurity is um, in relation to maintaining a secure IT system. Because there's a lot of different directions that you can go when you talk about cybercrime. Because there's, you know, as it relates to information technology, there's, um, you know, in intellectual property theft, copying of programs. Um, something that comes up in Asia more so than anywhere else is the the use of illegal versions or or non-certified or hacked versions of Microsoft office products or operating systems etc um, and another major factor is id theft um, it's important to make sure that all your stakeholders uh, your customers and your staff ids are protected in the system that there's no way to access them and that your staff have training um, on what information to give out um, for when people call on the phone, et cetera, or ask information about employees. Okay, we're getting towards the end of the lecture here. I'll go ahead and play this video. Okay, for some reason I seem to have lost access to the YouTube video window. I won't be able to show you the last videos. Uh, what I'll do is I'll drop the links into the chat window um, and then you can look at them on your own after the lecture is over. Oh, okay. So some other things that you need to worry about is maintaining the financial information of your customers, their credit card numbers, their bank accounts, um, that kind of thing. Um, and you need to make sure that you know all the computers in your networks um, maintain virus software, virus protections. Um, firewalls, all of this kind of stuff so that your systems are secure, your IT systems are secure. Now, some of the more human um, disadvantages is information overload. Sometimes um, we have access to too much information um, because of the way the technology works. Um, and it can be overwhelming for lots of people, not 
you know, depending on the position. Um, and so one of the things I like to do is I always recommend to my staff um, to take regular breaks. Um, and the important the, the important part is not just to put in your eight or nine hours a day, but is to put in eight or nine productive hours a day um, at a time schedule that works for you um, or when customers need you, um, wh whatever works. So if you, you know, so like to, in, in order to prevent information workload, it's much easier to do um, in a virtual company than it is in a brick and mortar company because you are, you know, there is the social pressure to always appear to be working, to always seem to be working, um, to not be taking a break. Um, that's common in an office environment. Um, and, and that can be detrimental and it can make people feel overworked and you have people working um, just to be working rather than actually producing or doing something productive. Um, and I think that's a byproduct of information workload. Um, okay, um, this is something I wanted to bring up because I noticed most of the literature, they talk about this as a disadvantage, physical conversation. Um, and that emails and telephone calls and video chatting um, and IMing um, has taken away, um, like we've lost something because of the physical conversation. Um, However, I, I tend to disagree with this, but I wanted to present it as it was as it's commonly presented in the literature. Um, and the reason why um, I don't I, in my career in both brick and mortar offices, especially, is I can't tell you how much time was wasted um, in meetings. Um, where the meeting started out with one function or purpose and then basically ended up not fulfilling that function or purpose at all. Um, I can't tell you how much time I wasted in Taiwanese companies in brainstorming meetings um, and those kinds of things. And so in my mind, um, in my industry, now uh, certain industries are going to require it, but in, in my mind, in my industry, um, when you work in a virtual company and you work from home, um, there's a focus on efficiency that you don't have when you're in a brick and mortar workplace. And there's no social pressure to always appear to be working. So you can take breaks when you want, then you can come back and work really hard two, three hours. You can then take breaks and come back and take breaks and come back. Um, you can get a lot more done efficiency efficiently that way than if you show up every day at eight o'clock in the morning and then you go home every day at five o'clock in the evening. Um, I just think that old the old the old nine to five paradigm of working um, for for certain industries just doesn't seem to work as well. Okay, one of the great things is uh, disadvantages is um, unemployment. Um, IT has made. Um, a lot of workplaces temporary or short term. Um, there's lots of freelance work, lots of contract work um, available through the internet. And there's less and less full time in the office work from the old model that used to be. Um, I think the fear is pri primarily driven because the system is changing, the way human beings work is changing. Uh, and I think that's what drives the fear, but I think unemployment um, and periods of unemployment can be detrimental to individuals um, as well as institutions and countries. Okay. 
Um, another thing that a lot of people consider is that it can be harmful to health because um, in an office environment, you tend to move more and walk more and stand up and sit down, et cetera. Um, but we are spending more time at our computers. We are spending more time um, working um, when you should be at home. Like, I mean, now you can work from anywhere you're at, right? So even if you are out in the park, you're still sitting in the park talking on the phone or sitting in the park doing things on your tablet, right? So you're still sitting, even though the environment's changed, the, the thing that would make you healthier hasn't. Um, lack of privacy. Um, this is something that's become a, a, a more important in the last few months. Um, in the, I guess the last few years than in the previous few years. Um, it's become increasingly difficult, especially with the proliferation of social media um, to maintain your privacy if you want to. Um, and then the last one, the last disadvantage is wasting time. There's a lot of ways that you can waste time on the internet, right? You can waste time on Facebook, playing games, chatting with friends, um, looking at pretty girls, looking at clothes, thinking of things to buy, looking at computers, you know, those things that you find fun to do. Um, you can now do them easy and look like you're working. So there is a certain amount of time wasted. Um, okay. So pulling it all together, um, we're here at the end of the lecture. Um, and pulling it all together, the the important part of this lecture, I think, is that with all the information technology that's out there that's available for business, the important thing to remember is that it's about people communicating, okay? So it's important not to get caught up in the communicate. It's important not to get caught up in the technology and focus on the people that are you are communicating with. Um, and so if you look at many of the advantages and the disadvantages, uh, many of the advantages are about being able to connect and communicate with more people. Um, and many of disadvantages are about the abuse of connecting and communicating with more people. So it's important to keep in mind who the people that you're communicating with are, uh, why you're communicating with them, and how information technology can enhance the communication. Okay. Okay. These were two videos on the future trends of technology that I was going to show and, and talk a little bit about. But because I don't have the YouTube link anymore, I'm not able to show the video. So um, if after the lecture is over and you want to watch these videos, you can go ahead and watch the videos um, and then email me if you have any questions or comments. Okay. So I'm going to open up the floor if anybody has any questions or anything they'd like to ask me about the lecture. Okay, I just want to say, um, if you would do wish to contact me, um, you can contact me at my email address. Um, feel free to contact me anytime. Um, and if you've enjoyed this lecture, please notify the staff at ABMS and let them know that you enjoyed my lecture. Um, I would really, I would greatly appreciate it. And the final slide here that I'm going to leave up on the screen is a list of books. Um, is a list of books. Um, if you've been to some of my other lectures, then you probably have at least some of these books in that list. And at least some of this particular lecture use some of these as well. Um, so if you... Um, if you have any questions or anything else you'd like to discuss, you can contact me on your email. Otherwise, thanks for coming out tonight, and thank you for um, coming to my lecture. I'm going to hang around for a few more minutes. Um,
and and let me know if you have any questions or comments.